So, uh, welcome to the afternoon mm -hmm. session of this conference. Uh, today we have two distinguished speakers for us. And the first speaker is Professor Zhang Si from University of Paris 6. Uh, and he's going to talk about uh, the most visible sites of bias random works from tree. Let's work on because it's probably the simplest uh, probabilistic model you can ever uh, think of which is not totally uh, trivial. Uh, so I write down xn to be a simple random walk on z. And let's say it starts from z. I guess I don't need to uh, define what it is because you know a lot about uh, models which are a lot more complicated than mine. Okay. So I need uh, some notation. So for any vertex on Z, for any point on Z, I write ln of x, the number of visits at position x, I'm a random walk in the first n steps. Well, actually it's in the first n plus one steps. Okay, so and that's half of my notation. Uh, so some people call it local time, it's discrete uh, uh, local time. Okay. And the other half of my notation, so it will be here. So for any given n, I will write down a n to be the set of sites <coughs> the set of sites x on z such that Ln realizes its maximum at position x. So we immediately realize that A n is a random set. It depends on omega and it's non empty because you always find at least one point uh, in this set. And that's all I need uh, for notation. So uh, an element in this set A n usually is called a favorite site or a most visited site by the random walk in the first n steps because it's a place where the random walk spends the most time in the first n steps. I guess the, the, the definition is perfectly trivial, right? And that's all you need to know. That's it. Okay. So Edish and the Ravens were the first I think it was in eighty four so they were the first to get interested in uh, 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 such processes or such random things. And they, so in their first paper in 84, they had asked, I 
think it was something like 15 or 16 uh, uh, open questions. And so that was exactly 30 years ago. And nowadays, I think at least 10 of them are still uh, uh, totally open. So let me mention two of the, uh, two of the uh, questions. So the first is the conjecture. It's from the, the Elish Railways paper, so I call it conjecture one because there will be another one. And they were thinking about the following thing. So look at this set of favorite sites at, uh, uh, in the first n steps. Since the, 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 the random walk is symmetric, so they think that zero has a fair chance to be favorite at the time. Right? So the argument, well, it's not a mathematical argument. They told themselves that, OK, maybe it's not always the case, but since the, uh, a zero has a relatively fair chance to be favorite, so it should happen more or less often. By more or less often, I mean infinitely often. So they look at the time and when zero is a favorite site, it means that local time at zero realizes this maximum value, and they count the number of such times n, and they saw that it should be infinite. So that was the first conjecture. It should happen with probability one. Almost surely it means with probability one. Okay. So that was the, the first conjecture. The second, from the same paper, the second one is also concerns this random set AR. But this time, they are interested in the number of favorite sites in this set. OK, so let me first make a trivial observation where well, Erdos and Rivers did. So they made the following observation. It happened quite often that there is only one point in it. That happens infinitely often. So along a subsequence, that's true. So if you count the number of elements in the set AN, so the cardinality of this random set AN, so it's totally trivial that infinite often, so along a subsequence for, 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 for N, there is only just one point in it. So it means that the cardinality is one. Okay, that's trivial. I guess everyone agrees with me. So with the probability one, you can find a subsequence along which AN there is only just one uh, element in it. If you think a little bit, then it's equally true, or almost equally <coughs> trivial to convince yourself that along a subsequence, there are only two points. It's not as trivial as the previous one, but actually it's quite trivial to convince yourself that. And it's very easy to prove that along a subsequence, there are only two points. And the conjecture is that that's all you can say. No more. Two is an upper bound. They think that, OK, maybe for n equal to 24, you can find three or even five favorite points. But if n is sufficiently large, then it wouldn't happen anymore. So the conjecture is that, almost surely, this will be smaller than or equal to two. Maybe it's wrong for n equal to 24, but for n sufficiently large. Of course, how large should depend on what we get. OK. So I told you that there are uh, other conjectures, but since they have nothing to do with my talk, so I don't think I want to, 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 to spend more time with, uh, with the accounts of uh, uh, such conjectures. OK. So these are problems. Now uh, it's time for answers. So I guess everybody uh, has noticed that the last talk will end at 2.50 and I will move it. So I'll start by presenting an answer given by Badinth Todd. OK, maybe I should So I'll start with conjecture two, so concerning the, 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 the number of points uh, uh, Number of favorite points at time n. I think it was in 201. So 
Valid, uh, uh, to prove that, if you replace two by another numerical value, then it's all right. So he proved that with probability one for all sufficiently large n, there are at most three point, three favorite points. And if you check his proof up, the, the, the main step is to prove that a, a random series is convergent. But this random series uh, uh, with positive terms, general terms, it's very, very complicated. And it's absolutely not clear why it should be convergent. So what Balin did was to compute its com uh, expectation. And he proved that the expectation is finite, so the random uh, the series is finite. OK, so that was the argument. And in order for the expectation to be convergent, he needed to replace this two by three. And if you check his proof, and if you write down two for the, uh, for the original uh, conjecture, you realize that the expectation actually uh, explodes. <coughs> I mean, it's infinite. But it's still believed that the, the, theory, the random series itself is convergent, even though it has a, a, an infinite expectation. So it means that this argument doesn't allow to prove uh, the second conjecture, but it doesn't contradict either. It's still believe that the conjecture itself is true, but it's open. OK, so that's the, all I wanted to tell you about second conjecture. I have no idea what happens. OK, so I'll uh, be back to the first conjecture. And that was studied by Bass and Griffin. Eight five, I think. So they look at the absolute value of and favorite point at time n. So <coughs> we know that uh, by uh, the result of thought, we know that there will be at most three when n is sufficient for that. Anyway, if there are many, it doesn't matter which one you take. So I take the minimum or maximum or whatever, or the, the middle one, if there are several of them. And Bass and Griffin, they were interested in how large this absolute value could be when n goes to infinity. Okay. And they find the correct normalizing <coughs> function, which should be square root of n divided a power, a power of log, let's say, to the gamma. And they prove that if you look at the lower bound, the lower limit when n goes to infinity, they prove that with probability 1, this lower, bound, uh, this lower limit is 0 if gamma is too small. By gamma is too small, I mean strictly smaller than 1. And if infinite if gamma is too big, and by too big, I mean gamma. And this is 11, it's not just 1. Sometimes, you know, there, is mistreat, there are misprints in the paper, but here it is really 11. So you see that there is a, 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 some gap between the two bars. OK, so once you see the, 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 the gap, of course, your first reaction was to ask yourself, which I mean, what is the critical value for, 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 for the power gamma here? And, well, that was done as well. Actually, that was done by myself. At least that's what I believed at that time. So at some stage, I think that was in 204. We prove that with gamma equal to 1, it's still true. That is still too small. And we prove that when gamma is strictly greater than 1, the lower limit should be infinite. That would be a perfect story. But everyone knows that we don't live in a perfect world. And soon, uh, shortly after the publication of the, the paper, we realized that there was, some, there was a mistake in the, mm. in, the, in the argument. And that mistake cannot be fixed. Well, at least we don't see how to fix the mistake. So the second part goes away. Uh, and nowadays, 
it's prompts. So if you take the original argument by Bassin and Griffin, if you try to be very careful with all the bounds and so on and so on, and it turns out that you can, you can replace 11 by, in my notes, I cannot, in my note it's written as something like that, so I even don't know whether it's a three or it's a five, but actually it doesn't matter <laughs> because it's not going to be one anyway. And that's written down the Max and Rosen book. I think the book was Okay, sorry? Yeah, okay. If, if conjecture one is true, yes. then doesn't, doesn't that mean that, that that thing would be the... Yeah. How, how, how does the... Sure. How does, how does the lower... How can the lower one be true? Sure. Well, well, it means that you were not sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so... Mm. Well, anyway, so let me finish first my uh, account of story uh, for, 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 the, the, uh, for this lower bound, yes? Mm. So, uh, it's, it, uh, so you can replace, uh, lower down a little bit this uh, power 11, but either to 5 or to 3, but certainly not to <coughs> 1 plus x. So, so far this is uh, 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 open. And I think it was about last year, this time, Richard Bass, uh, posted a paper on archive, and he proved that it, it, one is the correct one. Hmm. And I think it was soon before Christmas he sent a message to most uh, to many people, saying that uh, the referee found a mistake, and the mistake could not be fixed. So the same story. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's still anyway. Okay. So if you look at the fast briefing results, you realize that the first part actually is not that intuitive. That's why, okay, I did the first part. But the, 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 the more interesting part is in the second part. Because the second part telling you that if you take gamma to be sufficiently large, greater than 11 or greater than <coughs> or 5, then this lower limit is infinite with probability 1. And since this, the normalizing function goes to infinity, it means that this minimum go to infinity with probability one. <coughs> so with the probability one, you know that for all sufficiently large n, and there is no chance for this guy to be zero, which means that the first conjecture is wrong. <laughs> this. Okay, so that's more or less what I want to tell you about the motivations. So when I start working on this problem, I try to work out either of the conjectures, but like almost everyone else, I failed. So we turn to the next goal. We said, OK, we don't know anything about the conjecture for this simple model. So why don't we try the same problem for more complicated <coughs> models? That's why I want to look at bias random walks. It's exactly the same model as the one in the talk by Dayu this morning. So that will be the second part. So like in Dayu's uh, uh, talk, the tree will be Gautam Watson, a supercritical Gautam Watson. But I'm not as good as Dayu, so I'm not going to draw a Gautam Watson tree. I'm going to draw just a regular tree. But everything I'm talking about is still valid to supercritical Gautam Watson tree. So in my case, it's just a binary tree and so on. It's an infinite tree, but I stopped at this generation. Okay, so this <coughs> is the root, and I'm going to make a random walk on the tree. Okay, so far, no problem at all. <coughs> Except that in Dayu's case, the bias was uh, deterministic. I mean, the ratio of uh, transition probabilities is just lambda, which was a given uh, constant. And if I want my talk to be correct, 
I need my bias to be random. So that's the only difference. So what I mean by bi uh, random bias, so you are going to make a random walk on the tree. But before you do the random walk, I'm asking another person who is going to work a little bit on this tree. And his work consists in, give, in giving random colors to each of the vertices. And let's say it gives two possible colors, either red, that's it. So you give ID random colors. Yeah. And this happens with probability. So a vertex is colored red, let's say with probability alpha, and it's colored, let's say, blue with probability beta. So alpha and beta are uh, positive uh, numbers such that the sum is 1. If you don't care about Greek letters, just uh, assume that alpha is 1 half and beta is 1 half. Okay, it doesn't matter. The value doesn't matter. Mm. Okay, so now the person has done his work. It's your turn to make random work. And each time when you move to a place, you need to know which transition probability you are going to do. And you first need to look at the, the color of the place where you are. According to uh, our assumption, there are two possibilities. Either you are on the red one, let's say you are on the red one. So you have a father, you have two children, and uh, pictures. Yeah? If it's gotten worse than the number of children is uh, random. And I assume that if it's red, then the transition probabilities is a plus with probability a plus to to go uh, to visit your father in the next step and let's say a1 minus to visit uh, your child on the left and a2 minus that's the probability to visit your child on the right in the next step if it's Gordon Watson then it might have might have a3 minus a4 minus and so on and so on it doesn't matter. So that's the, the situation when you realize that you are on a red point. The, another possibility is that you are on a, 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 a blue point. Something very similar. You have transition probabilities. Let's assume that with probability B plus, you are going to visit your further next step, B1 minus B2 minus M possibly be three minus and so on. Okay. And now the model is very well defined and actually your movement is the so-called random walking random environment and we have already seen that uh, uh, from Dyer's talk this morning. Okay, I guess there is no problem with the definition of the model. So you first need to wait that person to do the work. So you first need to know all the colors of the, the, the site and then you you know the transition probability and you know your movement. And you get a very simple Markov chain if you know the, 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 the random color. So for cloud water trees, then you have to, you need the transition probability depends on the number of. Uh, yes, vectors. yes, actually it's a random, in that you see, in my picture, it's a random vector, uh, three dimensional random vector. Mm -hmm. But if we go to Watson, then it's a random vector, but whose dimension is random? That's the only difference. But okay, nobody cares about that. Yeah. Okay. So I need to tell you my assumption because of course the numerical values of the alpha, beta, a, a plus, a minus, b plus, and so on, they have some, oops, sorry, got the wrong color. <laughs> so I have an assumption which I call it assumption star. Okay. This is really the, 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 the most unpleasant part in my talk. So I never write this down uh, for myself. So if I look at the ratio, when you are here in the red part, if you look at the ratio of the probability of getting down and getting upstairs, so in that case, AI minus divided by uh, A plus, AI minus divided by A plus, right? So in my picture, you have two 
children. Yes? And that happens with probability alpha because with probability alpha you get a, a, a red one. Another possibility is you get a blue one that happens with probability beta and you also sum over all the children in my picture. Is two. And my assumption that this should be one. Okay, of course it looks not, it doesn't look very clear why I need to have such an assumption. If you don't like this one, then you are perfectly to the next one because I need another one. This time, not only I look at the ratio between the transition probabilities, but moreover, I look at ratio multiplied by log of the ratio. And I do something similar. It looks very complicated. And I wish to tell you that I never write this down for myself. And I assume that this should be zero. Because of the presence of log, I mean, it could be positive or negative depending on the, the value of the ratio. But anyway, at least I have an assumption which is perfectly clear. But so far, it looks like perfectly useless. So I need to explain a little bit where does this come from. OK, so I need to erase it. assumption which I call star actually is equivalent. So that's how I write down for myself when I write down my assumption. Usually I write it as follows. I sum over all the vertices in the first generation. So in my case, actually there are only two because I make, uh, made a picture of a binary tree. Yes? And I write something which I call e to the minus x, and I assume that this is 1. So I need to let you know what I mean by v. So v is actually so-called random potential process. So from the name, you see some physical, uh, physical meaning. So actually, I need to define what I mean by v of x. So v of x. Look at a vertex, whatever vertex, let's say look at this vertex x. And there is there is a unique shortest path that connects my vertex x to the root. Assume that x is in generation n, then this the the first one, which is the root, I'll call it x0. The second one, I'll call it x1, x2, and so on. And the x actually is xn. So this notation is totally different from Darius this morning. In Darius' case, xi is the i uh, 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 child of x, whereas in my case, actually, these are ancestors of uh, x. So that has nothing to do with uh, the xi in Darius' code. So then what I'm doing is I look at all the points, starting from the, uh, the, the, the one in the first generation, I look at all the points in this shortest path, and for example, for this one, and I look <laughs> at the ratio of probability between the probability of going down and probability going back. Okay. So that's what I'm doing. I from one to The other way around, sorry, I start from the, the first one. And I look at probability, which I, transition probability, I write it as omega, of starting from position xi, you go to your father, which is xi minus 1, divided by the tra transition probability from xi to one of your child, which is xi plus 1. And I take the log of the ratio and I make it sum. And this is what I, so, uh, what I uh, 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 
uh, called by potential. By doing this, there is a problem when the uh, x is in the first generation. So what you really need to do is exactly as what Dali did in the morning. You add another one which is the father of the root. Then everything is very well uh, defined. Okay. What's not defined is V of zero, but let's say because it doesn't matter. Then this is <coughs> absolutely very well defined and actually oops, excuse me. I know that my presentation is not very good if you don't recognize this process. Actually, this is the very first process we met in this conference. It's called the branch and work. Of course, on Friday morning when Louis Pierre introduced the branch and work, I mean, he he did it in such a smart way that everything looked very natural. Well, whereas with my talk, you get the impression that it looks horrible. Yeah, but it's, it's uh, uh, exactly the, the, the same model, no more, no less. Okay, so in that case, my assumption star actually, I will write it in forms of branch random walk, and the first one actually is equivalent to say that, and the second one is mean that. I sum over all the points in the first generation, and that's potential times e to the minus potential, <coughs> this expectation. And from the second one, you realize that V can be positive or can be negative because you want the expectation to be zero. OK, so one more line of, uh, uh, so I think I'm going to erase this one because it doesn't look very nice. I hope nobody. Uh, uh, so this is my real assumption. So it's known that under the assumption star, it's known that V of x go to infinite uniformly. So if you take the the minimum value in the nth generation and it still goes to infinity. When n goes to this was known to Lyons <coughs> in 1995. Okay, so I think your reaction is that okay, your v can be positive, but it certainly has negative values. Is it clear why it should go to infinity? And Okay, it looks a little bit mysterious, but Friday you, accept, you admitted everything. You saw a, a complete proof uh, from Louis Pierre's Minico. And I remember nobody had any objection. <laughs> and it was even worse than that one. Friday it was written as this. Okay, in my language. I hope at least some of them still remember this numerical value three halves. And we saw that for IID ones, you had one half, and for branching random works, you have three halves. It's exactly the same numerical value three halves here, except that I use my notation, which is different from Louis Pierre. Now you have a numerical constant, and then I hope you will agree with, or you would ad admit that maybe this assumption is not that mysterious because somehow under this general assumption you get some universal results. So I guess, okay, it's not a proof, but I guess everyone would admit that, okay, the, the assumption might not be as mysterious as it sounds. So it's not mysterious at all. Yeah? So this assumption actually it has a name. The assumption it has a name is called the boundary case in the study of branch random work. So for example, this is the type. 
Higgins and Cipriano equal for the light, they call this the boundary. Anyway, so under this assumption, star, it's known that, so, so far it's about random environment. So it's known that random work, so that's in 1992, it's known that the random work is recurrent. And actually, it's known that it's no recurrent. It means that although you wait for the random walk at whatever point in the, tr uh, uh, in the tree, your random walk will visit you as often as possible, but the expected, the expected time is infinite. So you may have to wait for a long, long, long time. Okay, okay so let me present my unique results here. So, so far, for simple random walk on the line, I told you that actually the favorite site is transient. And afterwards, people try some different models, and it's all, it's all in the case that the favorite site is transient, as long as you take a no recurrent model. So, for example, it's, tra it's transient for a uh, symmetric stable process, and it's uh, when alpha is strictly uh, bigger than one, because otherwise local time is not uh, defined. And it's also present for one dimensional random walking random environments. So somehow it's very strange that the favorite uh, 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 site is transient. So here is my unique theorem. So I use the same notation local time and site of it. Well, actually, I only need the first line. Ln of x is still the, the number of visits at the site x, except that now, instead of z, I take whatever site, whatever vertex on the tree, uh, and xi is random walk on the tree, not on z anymore, yes? And I look at the local time, the number of visits at the, the, the root in the first n steps, and let's say the maximum value. <coughs> it turns out that the correct normalizing function is n over log n. Then it converges in probability to something which I write it immediately. It's square root of pi over 2 of y infinite times, so the first is 1 and the second e to the minus the minimum value. Oops. So as a sequence of two-dimensional uh, two random vectors, actually I have convergence in probability. <laughs> actually I can prove more than that. Actually, it's almost true that uniformly for all x in the, the, the tree, then it converges to this with e to the minus b of x. But strictly speaking, it's wrong. It's not uniformly for all sites uh, on, on the tree. Somehow it stops at some stage because in the first n steps, you are not going to visit <coughs> all the, 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 all the uh, sites on the tree. So some works, you need to stop at somewhere. So if you assume that this is true uniformly for all x, then you see that actually the favorite site cannot be realized, <coughs> cannot go to infinite because of the results of lines. Because when x is away from the root, then the, 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 the potential is too large. So this guy is going to be zero, so the favorite site. So it's almost a consequence of the first one, not exactly. So the final way of favorite site. <coughs> under the annual, under the annual dimension. <coughs> I still need to tell you what y infinity is. Actually, it's a, a random variable which is strictly positive almost surely. This is the limit of a, 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 a positive matter which is still, the limit is still uh, strictly positive. 
uh, I think that's it. And what is proved is use so-called size-biased branching, uh, branching process. And I think we learned, it, it's not mysterious at all. Uh, uh, almost everybody knows what uh, it is. For those who are familiar with the branching process, so it's a usual technique in the study of branching uh, process. So this one actually is not, uh, uh, not deep. What is deep in this constant, that's why I put, put it here. This constant looks <laughs> familiar, but it's not exactly as what you imagine. Actually, this constant is it's exactly that will be my last line. Expectation of the maximum over interval zero one of a process which I call m bar minus m. M bar is the maximum. So one more maximum. So I need to tell you what I mean by M. M is a process defined on interval zero one. It's a so-called burning mirror. So for those who are not familiar with the Brownian meander, it's actually the Brownian motion. But OK, that's not exactly true. But condition on the events that <coughs> this is not exactly true, you need to justify this, such that it's always no negative during the zero one. Of course, when we saw this one, I mean, it looks highly complicated. We had no idea, but we knew where to find the, the, the solution. I mean, it was a common solution to everyone in, in, this, in, in Paris 6. Mark York? Yes. <laughs> so we asked the question to Mark York. It took him about 30 minutes, so it means that it was not trivial. But it took us about three weeks to understand uh, his solution. So, well, he passed away. <coughs> in general. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? How much do you use the fact that you have two colors? I mean, can you? Oh, yeah. The number of colors, it doesn't matter at all. It's the sim right. simplest example. And could you also do something like continuous kind of uh, bias? I don't know, like a, a spectrum. But what do you mean by continuous? I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, but uh, the tree need to be discrete. No, no, no. The tree is discrete. But yeah. the, how I bias every side. Oh, yeah. That's, that's mm. not. Oh, you because mean because then the so assumption. Have a random walk. That's right, why right, right, right. Okay. Yeah. So okay. in with the same assumption. Yeah. It's exactly the same generality as what you did in Friday morning. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Did your compute the simply compute the expectation or did you actually get the distribution of this? Oh actually so the distribution was known to someone called the layout scheme. I'm not sure about the, the he computed the, the exact distribution, but it's, it's not clear from his <laughs> exact distribution the, the value of this uh, uh, expectation because it involves all kinds of, uh, I cannot remember what it is. Area functions? I think it's slightly more general than, I think, some kind of mm -hmm. peculiar Bessel functions. Mm -hmm. uh, it looks horrible. Even Mathieu didn't recognize that it was square root of pi over square root of n. So or it's not a proof, but I think it's a strong indication. Mm -hmm. So, what do you mean? You, you mean you mean this is a formula, and you you can get the form the square root of pi over pi from this formula? Yeah. Oh, that proof is totally. Uh, I mean, Mathieu proved that. I mean, we copied his arguments, but okay. And now we claim that we understand uh, his arguments. <laughs> oh, you just mentioned yeah. his result. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, this part was proved by, by him. I mean, we simply used his results. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Your result uh, doesn't have, doesn't depend on your potential function omega. W, W or omega? Oh, yeah, well, okay, yes. Yeah. Mm. Not W. Yes. Any, any condition about the W? Uh, nothing, but I have condition on V, which is implicit here, right? So, mm. uh -huh. so my assumption is written for V rather than for omega. But I mean, that's equivalent. You know the potential if and only if you know the omega. I mean, they have exactly the same signal. No, 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 no. It's, it's not an equivalent. It is. It is. It, it is. is. Yes, it is. Oh, oh so, uh, yeah. so I, so I, mean, you have to present some more, uh, more clear at, um, condition about the omega. That's true. Yeah. Yes. I admit that. <laughs> yes, I mean, from your, your condition, condition, I was late. So from your condition, we cannot get uh, anything about the omega. Oh, uh, yeah, but you. You take the e to the v, then you make the, the product, and then you get the omega, and that's it. And the, the, uh, mm -hmm. the two fields, omega and the v, they have exactly the same uh, sigma field. Mm. Okay. Mm. So you have anything which is measurable with respect to, to v, if and only if it's measurable with respect to omega. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I, I apologize, but I, I, I didn't say anything about this relationship. More questions? Thanks, figure again.